Now I would like to introduce our board chair, uh, Larry Boyd, who is going to give some introductory remarks and welcome you all to the conference and talk a little bit about what's happening today. <coughs> I'm delighted to see you here. Uh, we've got a really good large group again of uh, obviously committed activists uh, who want to talk to each other and get some advice about how to even be better at act being an activist and an advocate. <clears throat> and uh, that's what we have in mind uh, for you in this conference. Um, I get to welcome you and I get to make a few observations about the context that, in which this conference is occurring. And, and a little more specifically what we hope to come out of it and then uh, thank some people, and then we'll be on to our uh, guest speaker for the evening. <clears throat> <clears throat> the context is so important uh, for the advocacy work that you do. You know, this afternoon, that was one of the messages to uh, the, the groups about how to work with uh, the MLAs. What's the context? Who's the person? You know, how do they feel about things? Well, <clears throat> the context that we're trying to do this work in in Alberta right now um, is more complicated uh, than ever, and it changes so quickly, and it's so unpredictable. Uh, and if that, you know, I, <clears throat> there was a speaker recently who uh, said that you, you have to realize that we live in a world that's characterized by the uh, acronym VUCA, mm -hmm. and, and uh, what he meant was that it, it was more volatile and more uncertain and more complex and more ambiguous all the time that those are the kinds of things, and get used to it, because that's the new normal. That's the context in which we are trying to do this kind of work. <clears throat> You're almost getting used to it being so unpredictable. I, I saw one <clears throat> columnist this last year after some of the things have happened. He said, henceforth, I will no longer be in the business of making predictions in my columns. I'm going to seek more honest work in backbiting and, uh, <laughs> and uh, backstabbing and finger pointing and keeping scorn given up on predictions entirely. <clears throat> if you think about where we've come in the last two years, and uh, how many of you were at our advocacy conference two years ago in 2015? Well, the, good, that's great. It's great to see you back. We put out this booklet at the time, uh, Priorities for Change, and we thought the election was coming a year later, and we had prepared to workshop it here, and they declared the election just before the conference. So. Nobody at that conference that I talked to, nobody was predicting that there would be an NDP majority government in Alberta that year. We thought we were going to take this booklet and try to push it with yet again hapless conservative government people. And instead, all of a sudden, after <clears throat> May the 5th, uh, you suddenly have an NDP government in the province. And then followed by uh, the departure. Uh, of Stephen Harper uh, from the federal seat and a clearly more progressive uh, government in place. And all of that in that year. <clears throat> and then last year, after one year of the NDP government being in power, we talked about uh, advocacy in the time of opportunity. Right? And then <clears throat> in the last, since that time, like how many of you were the, at that conference last year? Advocacy, oh great, advocacy in a time of opportunity. And so, <clears throat> what is it this year? You know, um, Think about what's happened just in that last year. And again, in terms of predictions, uh, I don't know anybody uh, who, like the, uh, on Brexit, uh, the polls were all saying it's, it's okay uh, for people who care about that, it's right. And then suddenly that kind of earthquake and the reverberations are just starting. And then followed up by the almost unimaginable spectacle of Donald Trump as President of the United States with a, <clears throat> you know, and, and the, I didn't know anybody here who was predicting that. They just thought it was either a joke or it was just ugly. I was in Toronto last uh, week and my four-year-old saw him on television and said, she pointed and she said, the poisonous banana. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and, and, and then you're watching all of this unfold and Canadian budgets waiting to see whether there's going to be a tax on, you know, border tax and all of this stuff. And yet, there it is, right? It's real. Like, you keep, for the first week, a lot of you probably just thought you'd wake up and it was just a really bad, long nightmare. <clears throat> no. 
In 1919, William Butler, Butler Yeats, the, uh, the uh, Irish poet, wrote a poem that probably lots of you are familiar with called The Second Coming. And at the end of it, he said, um, <clears throat> And what rough beast is our come round at last slouches toward Bethlehem to be born? Well, we know what rough beast slouched into Washington. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what's ahead for Alberta? Here we are, two years into a mandate, probably one year from the so-called red zone, <clears throat> with a government that would like to get it right and has got a lot of things right, has really got a lot of things right. But it's also hampered by, well, you know, look, look at some of the things, minimum wage, that was really gutsy, right? The farm bill, the, the farm and ranch bill that they got attacked for, uh, uh, maybe the communications could have been a little better, but it was also gutsy and it needed to be done. Movement on child care, you know, in, in, in a difficult economic time. A carbon tax, and there are a whole lot of people who don't like that, but I sure do. I think they moved in the and that was gutsy and they're paying a price for it. But <clears throat> I think that there's just a whole lot more work to be done. And there's also getting ready for the possibility of a united right, and you can see them out there. Uh, they've done the easy bits, and now they're going to do the harder bits, but they will get that, that right united in one form or another, and it's serious stuff. And so <clears throat> I guess that's the context in which we are talking about right now, bold advocacy for big changes. And it's not just because, oh, it might all disappear. It might all disappear. Well, you, you know, uh, Jason Kenney, I'm loath to, to mention his, his name, but Kenney's <coughs> observation was that he will have a summer of repeal. He will turn off the air conditioning in the legislature to help concentrate the minds, and then he will repeal every single piece of legislation that the NDP passed. That's... That's the rough beast that's slouching there, and he's, he's, he's not kidding about it, right? So, <clears throat> I, I think it's just extremely important to try to get it right over the next year, over the next two years, and then whatever happens in the time to come. We have choices, you know? We have choices in strategies, and we have choices in our language even. Like, <clears throat> I would recommend that you stop calling these people trolls, for example. Trolls are these cute little figures with colored hair, or they're, they're legendary, mythical creatures who live under bridges, but they're sort of cute. Hey, these people are racist, misogynist, hate mongers, you know? Racist, misogynist, xenophobic hate mongers, a lot of them. And I don't think you should dignify them. I don't think we should pick the phrase trolls for them. I think we should call them online hate mongers. And on the other side, with the alt-right, don't, you know, it's, that's just an alternative. It's just a really right-wing alternative. Nonsense. It's not just a right-wing alternative. <laughs> when you are a, a hyper-nationalist, when you're racist, when you're authoritarian, anti-democratic, you're a fascist. That's what a lot of this stuff is. It's either neo-fascism or it's just plain old fascism. But I don't think we should be calling them alt-right. Right? I think we should pick our words carefully, but more importantly, we should pick our strategies really carefully. And that, in essence, is what this conference is all about. Like, you're, you are activists, individuals, or from organizations that are activists, and we work together in a variety of ways. We work together with Parkland, we work together, like our three organizations, Parkland and Friends of Medicare and Public Interest in Alberta work very closely together. We work closely together with the Alberta Federation of Labor and the um, large groups that are on our board and, and support us and a lot of smaller groups. But we learn from each other. We learn at the Parkland conference. We learn the, from the work that, that Friends of Medicare does. And once a year we learn here from good speakers, from, from good speakers, and what are we looking for? We're looking for insights. We're looking for their insights. But we also learn from each other, right? So we, last time, gave you this completed package. This time, we've sent out by, by email, we've sent out 
our best take on priorities for change strategies in these seven areas. And we're going to pick your brains and we're going to find out your best thoughts on this. And we're all going to learn from each other. And then the test of a really good conference is, when you walk out, do you feel that you have fresh insights? And do you feel that you've been able to express your own insights? Because nobody knows your situation like, you're, like, like you do, right? And the hospitals in Edmonton are different from the hospitals in northern Alberta. And schools in rural Alberta are different from schools in in Edmonton and schools in the Northeast in Edmonton are different from schools in the Southwest and the same thing applies to Calgary. Like it's all about your insights into your own situations combined with advice from people like Erica and a lot of the other fine speakers that we have lined up. And as I say, the test will be when you walk out, do you feel that you've learned from each other and do you feel that you've learned from these speakers and do you feel that you've been able to give your advice on these things? I think you will, it's structured that way. A lot of work went into it, and I'd just like to say quick thanks to a few people. First of all, to uh, the PIA staff, and uh, to Joel, and to Monica, and Aliva, and, and Aliyah, who is unfortunately leaving us soon to go on to other pursuits. But the three of them just did a terrific job on putting this together, and thank you. For the conference committee was, was just great. And um, I'd like them just, if you're here, members of the conference committee, would just quickly stand, please. Bashful. <laughs> actually, you know what? Most of them are outside. There's Ricardo. We actually got him out of the chair. Anyway, to the conference <laughs> committee, it was work well done. Um, I want to thank the many volunteers that are working with us to make this happen, and we, we've got a lot of them. And the, the conference sponsors, and I, I want to just quickly read the names, the Alberta Teachers Association, the Alberta Union of Provincial Employees, Alberta Views, Alberta Federation of Labor, Civic Service Union Local 52, Friends of Medicare, Health Sciences Association of Alberta, Parkland Institute, United Nurses of Alberta. You think about those names and you, and you think about those groups, no wonder we're strong and we put up a darn good fight and we're making some progress. you to put your ideas into this conference and to take the ideas from other people and um, this is one piece of advocacy that goes on all year long but it's an important piece and we'll see you in a lot of other contexts doing the same kind of work and right now I can't wait to hear uh, Erica speak so thank you very much <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Um, and uh, when Larry started the phrase uh, with the adjective uh, unimaginable, I thought he was going to be talking about the Oilers' playoffs. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big hockey fan. So. Um, all right, I don't have that much more left to say. I'd like to welcome up uh, Jonathan Tetmeyer from the Alberta Teachers Association, who will introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Thank you, Joel. As Joel mentioned, I'm Jonathan Tetmar. I'm the Associate Coordinator of Communications for the Alberta Teachers Association. I'm also the Treasurer for uh, the Board uh, at Public Interest Alberta. Shortly after I started with the Alberta Teachers Association, I recall receiving an email with, uh, from someone with an organization that I wasn't quite familiar with, the organization called the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Coming from the classroom and being a bit more familiar uh, with the provincial scene at the time, I wasn't very familiar with their work. And so I went to my colleague, Tim Johnston, uh, in the office next to me and asked him about this organization and, and how I might respond to this email. Tim was clear and concise. Them? They're good. We like them. <laughs> he reached back to his bookshelf and he handed me a copy of a book, of a, of a journal actually, called our schools, ourselves. And that edition was themed media education and educating the media. And being in education and in communications, I found it absolutely uh, riveting read. I read it over the next few days and had my eyes open to the great work of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, and in particular, the great work of tonight's speaker. The next issue, I looked forward to receiving it, and again, I read it thoroughly uh, after I received it. It was called Raising Class Consciousness, 
Schools, Democracy, and Social Change. And I just thought maybe I would uh, tell you about some of the other titles and themes of our schools ourselves over the years since that time. <clears throat> Issues like Breaking the Iron Cage, Resistance to the Schooling of Global Capitalism, Carrying Each Other Forward in Aboriginal Education, Anti-Racism in Education Missing in Action, and I think one of my favorites, Freedom to Teach, Freedom to Learn, Professional Judgment, Authentic Learning, and Creative Classrooms. Since 2000, Erica Shaker has served as the editor of Our Schools Ourselves, Canada's premier educational journal, journal with a social conscience. When I shifted roles with the association, I referred a request from Erica to my new colleague Shelley, who like me was a little less understanding of the national picture. And Shelley received the email and then promptly walked over to my office and asked me who CCPA was. I replied, them? They're good. We like them. <laughs> So with nationalist and neoliberal trends landing on our shores through personalities like Donald Trump, Betsy DeVos, Kelly Leach, and Kevin O'Leary, I'm grateful that we have organizations like the CCPA and people like Erica to push back and to provide us with thoughtful, well-researched arguments against their privatization and corporatization agendas. Tonight, Erica will tell us about how progressives can deal with the challenges and opportunities of non-conservative governments at the federal and provincial level for once. How we can also stand up to the rising tide of right-wing populism, both abroad and at home. Erica Shaker is the Director of Education and Outreach with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. She has researched and written extensively on education, corporatization, privatization, intergenerational solidarity, and social justice for nearly 25 years. And we are honoured to have her as tonight's keynote speaker. Please join me in welcoming Erica Shaker. Thank you for um, that lovely introduction. Um, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Joel. And thank you to the staff at uh, Public Interest Alberta for making this trip very, very simple and for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you're tweeting, if you're taking pictures, I just warn you, I make the worst faces while I'm talking. So please wait until I've paused. Because <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, I look like I'm in a wind tunnel. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> So in the interest of full disclosure, I should make it clear uh, that I'm a fan of boldness in general. Um, but when we find ourselves, as arguably we do today, at the eye of an ideological storm, I'm more than a fan, I'm an advocate. Tonight I'm going to provide more of a national overview. But my hope is that, um, for those of you who may have a very different relationship with Ottawa for geographical or for historical reasons, at least some of what I'm highlighting will be applicable to you here in Alberta as well. I'll start with a brief recap. Two weeks after Justin Trudeau was elected Prime Minister of a majority Liberal government, ending a near, near decade of the Harper Conservatives, we were treated to a masterfully crafted, very Canadian coronation. A picture-perfect Canadian fall day blue sky, crimson maple leaves, crisp air, and a non-structured but somehow very carefully choreographed parade of beaming, eminently photogenic MPs waving and striding purposefully toward the swearing-in ceremony of the new gender balance cabinet. The mood was palpable, hopeful, nostalgic, optimistic, relieved. Canada is back, announced our youthful PM who though knew but was yet so familiar to entire generations of Canadians who had literally watched him grow up. There was more. A gender balanced cabinet, nice things were said at the public service and about the public service. Ministerial mandate letters formerly secret were posted on websites. The Canadian Labour Congress received an official visit. Climate change was added to the Minister Environment's title. And indicative of his utter hipness, our self-declared feminist PM announced he was also going to be Minister of Youth. It wasn't just about symbols. There were actual policies, too. The long-form census was back. Federal scientists were granted permission to actually talk about their research and not just to themselves. And the first Trudeau budget, while nowhere near perfect, did address several key areas desperately in need of funding. According to our estimates, about 30% of our alternative federal budget uh, made its way in some form into the actual federal budget, which is kind of unprecedented. 
There were some who insisted that under the rhetoric and the well-tailored suits, some less flattering political practices remained. But others were willing to be more patient, to give them a chance, while basking in those Meanwhile in Canada videos that suddenly seemed more accurate than aspirational. C-51 remained, and we were still doing arms deals with the Saudis, but RPM meets Syrian refugees at the airport at midnight. Cracks were beginning to show in the Liberal government's commitment to electoral reform and indigenous peoples, but RPM performs yoga poses on desks. Cash for access liberal fundraisers were beginning to attract attention, but our shirtless PM casually photobombs a beach wedding in BC while surfing. Cognitive dissonance aside, credit where credit is due, this was an absolutely brilliant drive-by makeover. But here's the thing about makeovers. They're short-term and cosmetic. They can often be about hiding flaws, not eradicating them. They're a pop of color pick-me-up, and even a therapeutic one at times, but also a distraction. They're a welcome solve to a battered self-esteem, but often delay a necessary deep introspection. We don't need a makeover. Here in Canada, we need reconstructive surgery. We are witnessing the last gasps of a decades-long and deeply in denial project in neoliberalism. And while the spectacle, I could say something else, south of the border, has provided at least some of us with moments of smug relief, it doesn't change the basic fact that when it comes to the Canada we tell ourselves we are, we have a lot of work to do. Canadians are still living with entrenched inequality, stagnant wages, household debt, declining union membership, and the protections that go along with it, <coughs> defunded social programs, persistent inequality, an eroded tax base, a CEO pay that once again is on the rise, and drastically lowered public expectations about what our elected representatives can do to address, let alone reverse, this regression. It wasn't always like this. In Canada, in spite of the spread of neoliberalism epitomized by there is no alternative Thatcher and Reagan, the social programs that were fought for and built in the post-war period did provide us with some insulation from the international trends towards growing inequality throughout the 80s and into the 90s. I am not suggesting that we lived in some anti-racist, anti-sexist, socialist paradise. More the pity. We were nowhere close to that, which is why simply turning back the clock to boldly move ahead is not the answer. But there's no denying that for broad swaths of the population, we were making progress. And then, the infamous Paul Martin budget of the mid-90s gifted us with our very own neoliberal watershed moment. Funding for social programs was slashed, and structural changes altered how money was allocated. Provinces were tasked with more of the heavy lifting, resulting in different responses depending on provincial priorities. The social safety net began to show signs of wear, Inequality began to accelerate, and over the next 20 years, the gap between the rich and everyone else continued to grow, fed by relentless attacks on unions that eroded the working class. This has been well documented by think tanks ranging from the CCPA with our decade-old Growing Gap project to the Conference Board of Canada. The OECD identifies Canada as being near the top or bottom of the heap, depending on how you look at it, in terms of the growth of inequality over the past 30 years, and inequality in absolute terms. Provincially, inequality has soared. Alberta went from the Canadian average in 1990 to the most inequitable province in 2011, which rather than being mitigated was actually exacerbated through the tax system. So what does this mean? Well, it means that in our biggest cities, the bottom 90% are worse off today than they were in 1992. Sorry, 1982. Wages have been stagnant for the past 30 years for the vast majority of us, and household debt is at 170% of income. Far from running on empty, our economy is literally being driven by household debt. The impacts of inequality are tangible. In the entrenchments of wealth, entrenchment, uh, entrenchment of wealthy neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, in growing poverty for working age seniors and adults, in shameful child poverty rates, particularly for indigenous kids off and on reserve, in stagnant or even declining inflation adjusted earnings. In 1982, median tax filer income was $31,500. By 2014, that's 32 years later, it had climbed less than $1,000 to $32,300. That's inflation adjusted. Even the IMF has acknowledged that inequality not only negatively impacts growth and social mobility between generations, 
It may also undermine trust and social cohesion and lead to conflicts. Prime Minister Trudeau alluded to this last month at a black tie affair where he warned the elites that inequality was driving public discontent with the elites. And these grievances are real. People are working harder than they ever have in an attempt to offset stagnant incomes and rising user fees and trying to save for an unpredictable future. The employment rate has not budged since the worst of the 2009 recession, meaning any decrease in unemployment is as a result of people who have simply given up looking for work. And the jobs that have returned are largely precarious and hard time. In fact, underemployed and marginally attached workers now un outnumber unemployed workers in far greater proportion among new immigrants and First Nations. Nearly half of all Canadians say they're living paycheck to paycheck. Currently, there are six unemployed workers for every job vacancy. Some of the more backbreaking work is done by temporary migrant workers with few of the rights granted to naturalized citizens and who are discarded when deemed no longer useful. And our EI system is not keeping pace with today's job market, where 20% of jobs are part-time and 14% are seasonal. It's not that people don't want to work. The issue is a lagging job strategy and an inadequate response to the trend towards part-time, temporary, and precarious work. Precarity is more than changing jobs in quick succession. In fact, job duration has remained quite stable across age groups since 1976. It's about working multiple jobs simultaneously, or working in the same location through a series of annual contracts that you'll never, you're never sure will be renewed, or never knowing how many hours you'll get from week to week. Our grasp of the extent of this problem is a bit tenuous because, frankly, Canada doesn't do an excellent job of measuring it. However, we know that a million Canadians have a second or a third job. We know that about 900,000 work part-time because they can't find full-time work, and another 390,000 work part-time to accommodate unpaid care work, which falls overwhelmingly to women. We also know that the trend towards precarity is growing. Half of workers aged 25 to 65 in the Greater Toronto Area and Greater Hamilton Area, where I'm from, are in precarious, insecure work, an increase of 50% over the last 20 years. Precarious work is also marked by lower hourly wages than those of full-time workers, no supplemental health benefits, an absence of paid sick days, and a lack of training which impacts one's ability to find new and more stable work. And children are affected too, because their parents are less likely to be able to pay for activities outside those provided by school, which is of course why cuts to school extracurricular activities is so devastating. And while insufficient childcare is a problem for Canadian families in general, it's a huge issue for workers in precarious employment. There are other spin-off effects, an inability to plan for the future, depression, a sense of isolation, less time to forge long-term relationships, or even have enough time to get to know neighbors. Insecurity and precarity changes how people socialize, how they give back to their communities, and relate to each other on a very tangible community level. After all, a poorly paid, insecure, and underappreciated employee who is trying to figure out if they have enough time to pick up dinner and drop it off with their family at home before rushing off to their other part-time job makes for a rather distracted, stressed, and overtired worker, neighbor, friend, partner, and parent. And this is significant because we're talking about changing how communities, families, friendships, and personal relationships work, or if they work at all. We're talking about social regression on a very basic level. And we need to acknowledge that this will fundamentally change how all of us, but especially those who grow up knowing only this reality, will comprehend notions of community and collective action. Precarity is not new for women, particularly single moms, for the marginalized, for the racialized, for immigrants. Precarity has been the norm for decades. What is different, however, is the degree to which it's infecting sectors and segments of the population that were once considered immune. When you take a look at poverty in Canada, what becomes apparent is how little that has to do with whether or not people are employed. In fact, more than a third of kids in Canada living in poverty are in a household where one family member has full-time, full-year employment. And single-parent households are predominantly headed by women who make 68 and a half cents on the dollar compared to men. Racialized women make an additional 19% less on average than non-racialized women. Add to this the explosion in housing costs, rising food prices, insufficient income that supports, and the lack of employment stability. 
And while the new, relatively new, child care benefit could lift a significant number of kids out of poverty, there's no question that the government's 40% figure is, to put it kindly, very optimistic. The day-to-day -day impacts of poverty are tangible. Food bank use is up in all provinces, except Newfoundland and Labrador, and up on university campuses too. One out of eight Canadian households has difficulty putting food on the table. Two out of five northern households and 62% of kids in the north are food insecure. Nearly one in four Canadians indicate they or someone in their house could not afford their prescribed drugs over the past 12 months, which also, of course, speaks to the lack of a national pharmacare program. There's a 21-year difference in life expectancy between Hamilton's wealthiest and poorest residents, a range of over two decades between a handful of city blocks. Nearly ten seniors receive the guaranteed income, income supplement and live on $17,000 a year. Some estimates suggest that the cost of socioeconomic disparities in the health system would be as much as 20% of all health care funding. So it's no wonder that, in addition to being a national shame, poverty is very <coughs> expensive, costing us anywhere from $72 billion to $84 billion every year. And all of these factors, of course, including homelessness, are compounded for children, particularly children of color and indigenous children. Canada is one of the more unequal societies among our peers where kids are concerned. And for the most excluded children, life is becoming increasingly difficult with implications for their physical and mental health. But the other unfortunate thing is that StatsCan's poverty rates do not include people living on reserve or in the territories, which means that Canada's official rates appear much lower than they actually are. Last year, my colleagues did a comprehensive analysis and found that Indigenous kids in Canada are more than twice as likely to live in poverty as non-Indigenous kids. 60% of kids on reserve live in poverty, and the rates for those off reserve, while a little better, are still significantly higher than for non-Indigenous children. This was irrespective of economic growth. When Alberta was experiencing record economic expansion, none of this was trickling down to the most vulnerable kids. And of course, we're still waiting for the federal government to stop fighting the UN Human Rights Tribunal decision that ruled First Nations kids are discriminated against because of inadequate funding for child and welfare services. And all this is the stuff you don't see in those Meanwhile in Canada videos. If we're talking about the kind of future we want for each other, understanding what young people experience is important. We love to beat up on millennials, but they are the canaries in the intergenerational, inter, in the intergenerational inequality coal mine. And this age group is particularly significant here, given the relatively uh, young age of Alberta's population. The income divide is being replicated across generations, and this is clearly seen in the cost of childcare and in rising tuition fees that result in often unmanageable levels of student debt. On average, $28,000 rising to $37,000 if you have both public and private debt, and most kids, a lot of kids do. Having student debt means you're less likely to have savings or own a home, or if you do own a home, you're more likely to have a mortgage. Debt makes it much more difficult to take a chance on a new job or on being innovative or experimenting with new ideas. It's related to depression, stress, and anxiety. And it certainly impacts when you can even think of having kids, let alone start to save for their education, at least until you figured out how to pay for childcare, which in Alberta's major cities ranges anywhere from about $825 to $1,000, and then forget about when you can even think about starting to save for your own retirement. Uh, some of what young people today deal with is not new, and I can tell you a bit about my personal history to illustrate that point. I went to university in Quebec um, in the a while ago, <laughs> um, when tuition fees were low for all students, not just those who happened to be from the province, like our Prime Minister, who was at McGill sort of at the same time I was. $19 a credit, low to be exact. So with help from my parents and income from summer jobs, I was able to graduate from my first degree debt free. A few years later, I decided to pursue a master's and I went to university in Ontario. And after 12 months, throughout which I worked three jobs, I graduated with $10,000 in debt after one year, some of which was forgiven, resulting in payments of about $100 a month for about a decade, which these days is peanuts. Contrast this with my partner, um, who obtained undergraduate and graduate degrees from an Ontario university after tuition fees sharply increased in the early 90s under Bob Ray, who at the time was representing the NDP. 
um, and grants were canceled. This resulted in 10 years worth of student debt payments at $630 a month. These monthly payments, uh, particularly when combined with childcare fees a few years later, impacted every single decision we made over the past decade, as a couple and then as a family. When we got married, when we bought a house, when we in the bank bought a house, um, when we had kids, and when we realized that buying a car was simply not going to be an option. In fact, I might go so far to say that our student debt, combined with the cost of childcare in Ottawa, which um, is on average comparable to what you would pay here in Alberta, was an incredibly effective form of birth control for the four and a half years between our two kids. We literally had an Excel spreadsheet for financial and family planning because we literally had no room for surprises. Actually, my, the spreadsheet was my partner's idea. He's less whimsical than I am. So, um, yes, my partner and I had the debt and the cost of childcare to contend with on top of basic living expenses. Yes, the impact of the debt we had incurred stuck with us far beyond the final payment which we made about seven years ago. Yes, tuition fees have climbed even higher since, which we're saving for to spare our kids as best we can now that we've finished with the most onerous part of childcare payments. But here's the difference. Before our student loans came due, we found permanent, decently paid, unionized work with benefits that include pensions. And today, that's a luxury, even one might say a privilege, that a growing number of people can only dream about, even if they're working in sectors that once traditionally provide, provided stable, reliable employment. The finance minister and the prime minister slash minister of youth argue that job churn as they call it, is simply today's reality we need to get used to. But as a euphemism, job churn isn't particularly accurate. It plays on the stereotype of young people drifting from job to job as a sort of carefree millennial bumblebee who on one hand don't want to be tied down and on the other unreasonably expect some semblance of financial security. And it suggests that we are prepared to ensure that the birth rate of future generations is one of consistently declining standards which is the exact opposite of progress. Progressives have a lot of work to do, there's no question. And it pays to be prepared. So I'm going to focus on three common themes that, I, now that I've depressed you all, three common themes that I, and I'm betting you too, find we often have to confront when arguing for alternatives. One, you're going the wrong way. Two, it's too much to think about. And three, it's not that bad, it could be worse or it has been worse. So I'm going to deal with number one really quickly because I just spent a huge chunk of your time talking about it. We cannot afford, socially, financially, or morally, the status quo. We cannot pretend that this is the best we can do because we owe ourselves, our future generations, and those who have borne the brunt of neoliberalism and austerity far more. And we cannot allow ourselves to capitulate to the pretense that incremental change is somehow sufficient. At best, that means spreading around system variability a little bit. And we saw how well that worked out for the Democrats during the last American election. It's generally those with the most who argue the loudest that the rest of us should be satisfied with incremental changes that they themselves would never settle for, and neither should we. Number two is a little trickier because it is rooted in truth. There is no way to gloss over the fact that we are talking about necessary, yes, but huge changes. Overhauling our economic system that privileges the few at the expense of the many. Massive reinvestment in social programs that have been battered and undermined for decades, and creation of new ones like pharmacare, childcare, long-term care, for example, that address how society has changed. Moving beyond statements that acknowledge inequality, racism, ableism, sexism, classism, and actually integrating this analysis into how our public institutions operate, serve our people and communities, and treat their workers. Acknowledging the need to immediately move towards an economic and an employment system that is not only more fair and stable, but does not depend on the further degradation of the planet. That is a lot. And we cannot blame people for being overwhelmed at the sheer magnitude of the task ahead. That the system isn't working for so many of us is no longer a secret. The danger is when no one is prepared to explain and champion workable solutions to the problems we collectively face. Nature, as they say, abhors a vacuum. 
And in the absence of solutions, people and those who want to take advantage of their despair will turn to scapegoats. Which brings me to number three, which on the national stage these days sounds a lot like we're better than Trump, or at least we're not as bad as Trump. But over much of the past year and a half, it sounded like Canada's back, or because it's 2015, or after 10 years of a Harper government. And look, I get it. That was an exhausting decade. <laughs> Information, the press, and science were being silenced. Progressive charities, ours among them, were being targeted with audits. Women's rights were questionable. Public institutions and labor unions were under attack. There was actually talk of people not sewing tiny Canadian flags onto their backpacks while traveling. And I don't mean that in a snarky way. Well, not entirely. I'm kind of snarky most of the time. <laughs> but depending on your relationship with the state and its institutions of power, being proud to be Canadian or even feeling Canadian, whatever that means, is not always a given. But by the 2015 election, progressives, or at least non-conservatives, felt demoralized and embarrassed. And I think this went beyond policy. I think it had to do with the actual visuals themselves. Applauding, cautious, patriarchal, decidedly non-youthful prime minister, who suddenly seemed not so much experienced as just dated and controlling and well past his best before date. There is no question that a similar weariness after decades of a government that suddenly seemed arrogant, dated, and entitled was also percolating in Alberta back in the spring of 2015. The unwritten subtext was clearly time for a change. Not just a change in party or a change in leader, but a change in self-perception. A change in how many Canadians wanted to be seen, thought of, and think of themselves. We all know how that ended, and I'm not here to debate the specifics of why, within a very short period of time, Canada went from blue to red, and not blue to orange, as it did in Alberta. I think, however, it's safe to say that, whether through nostalgia, or well-crafted visuals and messaging, or campaign materials, Trudeau made non-voting liberals feel good about voting liberal again, and scooped up enough of, the, enough of the opposite of Harper votes to win what's been termed a miracle majority, thanks to what we were promised would be the last election decided by first past uh -huh. And here we are. Two budgets and 18 months into a government that's no longer new or quite as shiny. In other words, for policy wonks and community activists and people who temporarily park their votes in the red zone, at least nationally, there's lots of material to work with. But in spite of the need to hold this government, as with all governments, to account, we must also acknowledge the deep-rooted desire on the part of so many Canadians to believe still that they can feel better about themselves because of a change in leadership and a change in visuals. That through a rebranding, we are somehow all more youthful, more current, and definitely better dressed. Which means that it's about more than just confronting government policy decisions. It's also about confronting how a not insignificant swath of the public, even if they're beginning to be a bit jaded with the government, are still personally invested in how the image of this new prime minister makes them feel about their country and even about themselves. That's the makeover effect. For the progressive policy field, this poses a challenge. We have to analyze policy decisions and propose better ones. We also have to navigate significantly lower standards for what can be expected from a government the public wants to think better of, at least where the avatar of the government is concerned. Here this means having to accommodate progressive friends still overwhelmed with the accomplishment of having the only remaining provincial NDP government in the country and in Alberta. The additional wrinkle for progressives, and this is relevant on both the national and provincial scene, is the looming specter of a much more regressive choice for voters which potentially gives non-conservative governments the space to do way less, or just not enough, while still looking way better by comparison. This is more than just future challenges from another party. Progressives also have to deal with a dark reflection, in many ways an unprecedented one, just next door, whether in another country or in another province. It gives all sorts of cover to governments who may already be considering reneging on some big policy promises from climate justice to electoral reform. It makes it easier for even friendly politicians to avoid the admittedly difficult topic of progressive taxation, for example. We saw that last week with a federal budget that wasn't just back-end loaded when it came to rolling out vital program funding over the next decade. 
It was back-end loaded when it came to any decisions that might give the anticipated Trump tax cuts an advantage. We'll have to wait till the fall update to see what, if any, revenue-raising policies are changing to the tax system the federal government is prepared to make. Alberta, of course, saw it provincially in a budget that resisted the urge to cut and actually made some investments, though arguably insufficient ones, but refused to deal with the elephant in the fiscal room, an inadequately progressive tax system, which would absolutely be a game-changing political seismic shift. There is a huge danger to this play-it-safe or lowered expectations strategy. Trudeau spoke of public anger at growing inequality, and that's very true. But the other half of that is the public anger and disillusionment at governments that aren't seen to be taking action. Governments that promise one thing and then public consultation another. Governments that repeat catchphrases like restoring fairness and inclusive growth during campaign season or in budget speeches, but then fall short when it comes to implementing policies that actually make tangible improvements in people's lives. And the beauty of this disillusionment is that it doesn't differentiate between levels of government. Because according to the narrative, they're all the same, regardless of jurisdiction, and each proves the inadequacy of the others. For many, this disconnect has become unbearable. It was behind the rise of Syriza in Greece, reminding us that the political response doesn't have to be regressive. But Brexit and Anorexit show us how people respond when the progressive alternative is busy defending the intolerable status quo with phrases like, the economy has never been stronger, or incremental change. Rhetoric and platitudes that ignore or contradict people's realities are not an effective defense against right-wing populism. We need concrete alternatives, thought out, costed, and defended, to counter the targets of choice for the right that are, predict that are predicated on leveraging social divisions to push a regressive agenda. And that brings me back to the two potential directions in which we as a society can go, scapegoats or solutions. Spoiler alert, I pick solutions, and fortunately we've got some good ones. I've got ten. <laughs> the federal election demonstrated that there is some public appetite for deficit spending on a limited and temporary basis to reinvest in social programs and the economy. Alberta, too, has reinvested in key social programs and has maintained this through multiple budgets, running deficits to do so, and defending the need to provide rather than cut and enhance social safety net during times of economic hardship. This is a laudable point to make. But what's missing at both the provincial and federal level is an unapologetic recognition that we do not have a spending problem, we have a revenue problem. We need to talk about how to grow our fiscal capacity. And this means making our tax system more progressive. It means closing tax loopholes that privilege the very wealthiest while starving our economy of the funds that support social programs that benefit us all. Canada spends over $100 billion annually on tax loopholes and expenditures, the majority of which benefit the richest. Canceling a small handful of them would immediately make the system more while injecting billions, literally billions, into the economy. And there are other options. A provincial sales tax where none exists, which can partially be offset for low-income earners. A rejection of regressive taxation in favor of one that is progressive would raise significant revenue and help address the scourge of inequality. These are all viable options that need to be on the table if we are to have a mature conversation about how we pay for the society we want, how we make it fair, and how we ensure everyone from the wealthiest to the most vulnerable has a decent quality of life. Two, we need massive public investment in cradle-to-grave social programs and infrastructure. Funding increases to keep up with inflation are the bare minimum of what's necessary, merely because they maintain the status quo, and as we know, the status quo isn't good enough. Not only have our programs been gutted by decades of neoliberal policies, the needs of our society have grown. Schools and hospitals and social services are having to deal with the heartbreaking fallout of austerity, precarity, and insecurity. It's a refreshing change when I look at tuition fees across the country for me to be able to speak positively about what Alberta has done for university students. I've never been able to do that like the whole time I've been monitoring this. But tuition fee freezes look good, freezes look good, only when compared to the alternative we've allowed ourselves to settle for. Ever higher user fees for students and their families rather than the more equitable and efficient one we could demand, fully public post-secondary education and training. Think of where we could be with universal childcare, with pharma care, with long-term care, 
with better and truly public public transportation, with a robust and sustainable housing strategy, with an enhanced CPP that allows people to retire with dignity. Not only is there a profound economic return on creating and investing in social programs, it provides the basis from which we can create a more just and equitable society, where divisions between generations, neighborhoods, and communities can't be so easily manipulated. And drawing our public institutions is a fantastic employment strategy as well, because there is no question we need a job strategy that is predicated on stability, respect, pay equity, environmental sustainability, long-term security, including retirement income, and the recognition of the changing needs of workers and their families. We must protect those labor rights we have won, regain the ground we have lost, and fight like hell for those who do not yet have those rights and protections. We need to not manage or accept precarity as the new normal, but rather ensure that everyone is entitled to a job that allows for planning, predictability, and a decent standard of living. We must acknowledge the terrible toll that insecurity is taking on our mental health, our families, our well-being, our communities, and support those institutions that are predicated on supporting each other and, can, and strengthening community networks and infrastructure. We need to unapologetically support public sector jobs that, far from being a drain on the economy, are actually strengthening local economies as a result of fair wages, job security, and benefits. And more challenging, we need to be prepared to be specific when it comes to how things will change. Telling people whose livelihoods depend on the sector that is scaling back or that we're moving away from that not to worry, they too will have a good job one day that is green and stable, is simply not going to understand their, or alle simply not going to alleviate their understandable anxiety at what this means for them, where these jobs will be, or what they'll look like. We need to understand that anxiety, respect it, and provide answers to it. Once in power, progressive parties can be friendly, but they are not your friends, even if they return your phone calls. <laughs> like any government, they need to be held to account, acknowledged for the positive changes they make, but relentlessly held to standards about how to move the dial in the correct direction. Will they take advantage of the it could be worse rhetoric? Or are they prepared to take the heat from those who don't support them, and let's face it, never will? for taking the transformative progressive stands that improve everyone's lives. This is actually, I think, where the provincial context can work in your favor. The policy and funding changes the governments can make here are much more tangible to people in communities. School funding cuts or increases have immediate implications. Ending funding for public busing is going to be noticed right away, which means that there are a lot of potential rallying points or pressure points to use in organizing against cuts and in pushing for enhanced support, connections that are often a lot harder to make federally simply because they're less visible. Activists and organizers, particularly if they have resources and a supportive infrastructure like a union, need to create spaces like this one for more progressive voices and policies and then promote and defend them to their friends and neighbors through engagement, listening, acknowledging daily struggle, and building alliances across communities, generations, and sectors. Make sure those who are the most vulnerable are at the center of your work, that they are given the space and platform to speak for themselves and for those they represent. Remember, for many marginalized communities, these struggles are not new. It's just that now, people once sheltered from the worst impacts of neoliberalism are feeling their effects. This isn't inherently bad, and it, it just means that there are more of us, and collectively we have more skills and resources to pool together but we must be exceedingly careful that we're overcoming marginalization and systemic inequality, not reinforcing it with our actions and our good intentions. This means acknowledging that sometimes there are those better positioned to be at the front of our movements, that sometimes our job is to support, not lead, and never forget the long and violent legacy of colonialism that still exists today. Confront neoliberal arguments unapologetically. Point out hypocrisy and contradictions. Why is debt bad for governments, but character building for students? <laughs> what will really reduce inequality and crushing household debt? A financial literacy class that teaches kids the difference between a checking and a savings account? Or a job strategy that's not predicated on precarity and worker disposability? Why are anti-worker corporations like Uber referred to as innovative while using the publicly owned national infrastructure of our postal system to implement a postal banking system is mocked as naive or wasteful? Why do politicians make loud noises about literacy rates on the one hand and then cut funding for public libraries on the other? 
Why is tax and spend a label that progressive governments shy away from when the alternatives, tax and no spend, no tax and no spend, no tax and spend, make far less sense, are unaccountable or unsustainable? Even the most welcome words must be followed up with action in order to be meaningful. Acknowledgement of inequality by politicians is a direct result of movements like Occupy that made the 1% and the 99% part of the vernacular. And we know it resonates. Look at the grassroots response to Bernie Sanders. But what sustained his level of support was the fact that Bernie made inequality and social justice and a progressive tax system central to his campaign, not just to his rhetoric. Words alone are merely performative. We need policy that's transformative. But word choice, as Larry said earlier, is important. So keep an eye on the terminology. When social programs or labor victories like sick days or safe workplaces start being referred to as entitlements, pay attention. Reframing rights as entitlements is a powerful narrative tool. Remind people that at one point, many rights they now take for granted, like health care, were considered entitlements because we hadn't yet organized and fought so that they and their kids could benefit. And if you can't support by showing up, and there is no question that people are busy or supporting their own um, particular focus, uh, areas of focus, support by speaking out. Challenge the stereotype of the selfish activist. When students march for lower tuition fees, they're not marching for themselves. They're already in debt. They're marching so your kids don't have to be. When teachers protest for smaller class sizes than the ones you had, that's a good thing for your kids. If the point is progress, we need to stop scoffing at those who dare to dream that they or their children deserve better than the status quo. But in spite of everything, I'm an optimist. I have kids, I have to be. <laughs> but there is no question that we're at a pivotal moment. Trump, or the rise of the far right, as uh, symbolized by Trump, has succeeded in gifting us with a common target or symbol of the regression we must resist. We've seen mammoth rallies that count among their ranks people who haven't protested in decades, if ever. That we have a revitalized civil society is a good thing, but there's so much work to do to turn this into a movement, one that recognizes and practices solidarity <coughs> between people, communities, and sectors, and is grounded in, and this is very important, a robust class analysis. Some people will come to this analysis themselves and will see the Women's March as their first step along the long road to civic activism. Others need help to connect their political awakening to anti-racism movements, the Fight for 15, the labor movement, fair trade, indigenous sovereignty, climate justice, public education, health care, and that's work we need to be prepared to do. We have to help each other make these connections. We must understand how our interests intersect if we're to make progress with and not at the expense of each other. We need to have faith in our positions, learn from each other, keep our elected representatives, even friendly ones, honest and at arm's length, and keep pushing tangible, workable solutions to the problems we are collectively facing, whether it's expanding fiscal capacity by making the tax system more fair, moving towards a fully sustainable economy, or building and enhancing universal programs that meet the needs of communities across the country. And we need to keep our standards high and not settle for makeovers when we reconstructive surgery is what's really required. For transformative change to become a reality, we must insist on what we need with no apologies for wanting something better than what we have now. Resist the predictable chorus from the right or those who have internalized their arguments as common sense and persist in the work required to move the dial towards a progressive future. Thanks for your time tonight, your passion, the work you do. This is going to be a great event. I'm looking forward to boldly learning from you all. Solidarity. Thank you.